Today we're here at the National Museum of the United States Air Force and we had a visit from Mr. Sid Davis who is a press pool reporter on the uh, day that President uh, Kennedy was assassinated in November 23rd, 1963. He was one of the three members of the press who were actually permitted on the aircraft for the inauguration of President Johnson. I can't walk by the White House without today without remembering what happened there, the death of President Kennedy. The arrival was beautiful, the people of Dallas were friendly, it was enthusiastic, there was not a cloud in the sky, it was a beautiful clear day, it just seemed like it was the right day to campaign. I was on press bus number one in the motorcade. Uh, it's estimated that we were either uh, number eight in line or about 11. We're between eight and 11 cars behind the presidential limousine. The rest became a keenly etched memory for all America and the world. Earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trade mart. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. We heard the shots clearly. We, I heard three distinct shots. Uh, my seatmate on the press bus was Bob Pierpoint of CBS, who had covered the war in Korea. So uh, he knew what gunfire sounded like. We thought at first it was a motorcycle backfire from one of the many motorcycles alongside of us in the motorcade. Bob Pierpoint jumped out of his seat and said, that's gunfire. And within seconds, we looked up ahead of our bus and uh, we saw a commotion at the presidential limousine area. The distance between us and the car was about 80 feet. Uh, and so we saw the crowds then responding to the gunfire by charging through the motorcade cars to get to one side of the street or the other. They didn't know where, where to go for safety. They heard the shots. They saw the commotion in the presidential limousine. Uh, there was a grassy knoll, they called it, a uh, grassy area where we saw, I saw a father place his child down on the grass and placed his body on top of the child because they didn't know what was happening, but he knew that he knew he had heard shots and gunfire. So he placed his body on top of his child. We went to the trademark I ran and found a telephone. There were 2,000 people in the trademark waiting for the president to arrive. They didn't know what happened. They just saw a herd of reporters rushing through the hall looking for telephones. I grabbed a phone, called Washington to my office. They said, the president's at Parkland Hospital. Get, hospital, get there as soon as you can. Uh, I first tried to get into the emergency room, and I couldn't. That was under seal. I saw the Secret Service agents cleaning up the back seat of the limousine. Uh, Clint Hill was one of them. Uh, cleaning up the, the rear seat where the blood and parts of the president's brain were on the seat. My friend Hugh Seide of Time Magazine had talked to Clint a few minutes before I got there, and I think uh, Hugh Seide, White House correspondent for Time, asked Clint, who was a friend of ours, uh, what, how, how are, how's the president? And Clint said, he's dead. Just like that. I had to repeat the pool report so many times that day, filing my story. Uh, while I was filing, a uh, White House official grabbed me and took me aside while I was live on the air. And I said, I can't talk to you now, I'm on the air. And he said, you have to come with me. And I said, I can't come with you, I'm on the air. And he said, no, I used some profanity trying to get him loose. He was holding my suit, suit collar, pulling me away. And finally, I just went with him. I said goodbye on, on the air. I'll talk to you later. And I went with him, and they took me downstairs with two other reporters, Merriman Smith of the United Press International, the senior correspondent at the White House, and Chuck Roberts of Newsweek. They're both good friends of mine. Actually, they were mentors. They were older. They'd covered World War II as combat correspondents. Uh, they were wonderful friends. And we, three of us, were placed into an unmarked police car. And we were raced to Love Field. The police officer driving was doing about 70, 75 miles an hour to get to the airport because we didn't know whether Air Force One had taken off yet or not. But President Johnson wanted the press on that airplane. He wanted a, the press to be aboard to witness the swearing in, which is probably a very wise decision to have witnesses to this thing uh, for history and for just the facts, the real facts, so there are no rumors about what took place. 
And we arrived at Air Force One when they were placing the casket aboard. Mrs. Kennedy was helping the Secret Service put the casket on board the airplane. The casket would not fit through the hatches. It was too wide. It was a 600 pound bronze casket. The agents went in inside and got an ax from the inside. The airplanes do have an ax aboard. And they took the ax and they knocked the handles off the airplane. I don't know whether there were four or six handles. And they knocked the handles off. They got it through the hatchway door. I heard the president ask Marie Famer, his secretary, to go and ask Mrs. Kennedy if she would like to stand with him for the swearing in. And she sent word that she did, but she needed a few minutes to compose herself. And after a few minutes, Mrs. Kennedy appeared into the conference room. And then at that point, I saw the gravity of the situation. I saw what she had witnessed on her clothing. Her suit, this beautiful raspberry-colored two-piece wool suit, uh, had the markings of the t terrible thing that had happened. Pieces of the president's skull, uh, flesh, blood on her clothing, splattered. I looked at uh, Mrs. Kennedy's stockings and uh, the right stocking was heavily congealed with blood where she had cradled his head in her lap. On the left leg there was not as much but there was blood on her left stocking too. And I realized what she had endured. Uh, she kept up her courage. Uh, she was aware of what was going on. She knew what had happened. Uh, she felt it was her place to be in that picture. I will ever, ever believe that it was part of her patriotism, really, that she felt it was necessary. At some point on the flight, when asked by a, an aide of hers, Mrs. Kennedy, would you like to clean up while we're en route back to Washington? And Mrs. Kennedy said, no, I want them to see what they have done. And those words have reverberated throughout the history of the assassination. Well, you can't help but feel uh, a great deal of uh, emotion when you stand here in the airplane that uh, 1963, uh, we're talking well over 50 years, uh, 54 years, 53 or 54 years. Uh, I've, I've not forgotten any part of what took place on the airplane. I, it's as fresh in my mind today as it was back then because I've been asked to tell the story so often. But I never believed that uh, when I was a young reporter in Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, that I would ever cover a story of this magnitude. I never believed that I would be a pool reporter where it was my responsibility with two other reporters to remember everything that happened so we could report back to the rest of the press that covered President Kennedy's trip to Dallas. The assassination has a lot to do with the impact of Kennedy's involvement with the airplane, of course, the assassination is a big part of it. And the fact that the casket was carried aboard Air Force One back to Washington. Uh, there's no way you can erase the history of it. Uh, and it's associated a lot with Kennedy because Mrs. Kennedy was involved in the design of it. It still remains the same. The, the uh, pattern of the, of the, even on the 747, the pattern pretty much resembles what this airplane looks like. Uh, to many people in foreign lands, this is the United States. So, and it shows the power and strength. That's what it shows. It's, it's a very powerful looking airplane.